Welcome to the flock! Let's dive into thermochemistry in the concept of phase changes and heating curves for water. Stick around to see how it's done. If we were to hypothetically have a glass of ice and set that glass of ice on a hot plate and warm it up consistently over time, what would our graph end up looking like if temperature is plotted on the y-axis? Let's go over what we know about water. We know that water in its solid state, or ice cubes, is anywhere from 0 degrees Celsius and lower. We know that between 0 and 100 degrees Celsius, water is a liquid, and anything greater than 100 degrees Celsius, water ends up being a gas, or steam, also known as water vapor. So back to this hypothetical ice cup on a hot plate or a stovetop. While the ice is ice in its solid form, it's going to stay at zero degrees Celsius. It's not going to change because if it changed from zero degrees Celsius, it would be a different state instead of solid. But as we continue over time to heat this ice in the cup, we would see the ice start to disappear and all we'd have then is liquid water. Now, what would that look like on the graph? We wouldn't have just a bunch of these horizontal lines going from zero to 100 degrees, because we know that from zero to 100 degrees within this point, it is a liquid the entire time. So if we were to be doing this experimentally, we would see that the graph would be going up like this, and it would be rather jagged. There would be ups and downs and all arounds, but it would be going up at a diagonal towards the 100 degrees Celsius. Now what happens once it gets to 100 degrees Celsius? We know at that point, it goes from a liquid to a gas. So just as before, there would be a horizontal plateau here because it's going from a liquid here to a gas state. Now if we continued heating it, it's impossible for liquid water to get hotter than 100 degrees Celsius. In other words, you literally cannot have liquid liquid water at anything between 120 and 100 degrees Celsius. It doesn't exist. So from there on forwards, if we continued heating it over time, our liquid water would turn into a gas. So as the water molecules turn into a gas, notice that they stay together as H2O. They're not breaking apart into H and OH and floating around like that, or H2 and O2. That doesn't happen. When water turns from its liquid state into a gas, it's still H2O. Just just in its gas form. So then what would that look like on the graph? Again, we would be kind of going upwards towards the 120, and during that entire phase, we would be a gas. How about this range down here from zero to negative 20 degrees Celsius? We know that in that range, water is literally impossible to be a liquid, assuming we're at constant pressure. So it would have to be a solid that whole time. What we would see then is it would also be a downward slanting diagonal towards the negative 20 degrees Celsius. And within that entire diagonal range, our water would be in its solid state or ice. So what does this mean for any heating curve for any chemical? Well, if you were going to do this experimentally with any other chemical, if you ended up seeing a diagonal or a slant upwards, we know that that's when that chemical is in a state, a certain state, like solid, liquid, or gas. And anytime you would see a horizontal line like this, that's where a phase change is occurring. In other words, if you're going from a solid to a liquid, that's a phase change. If you're going from a liquid to a gas, also a phase change. Likewise, vice versa, gas to liquid, phase change, liquid to solid. You have to go through the phase change. Here's the same kind of plot drawn a little bit nicer. Notice that here on the x-axis, we've labeled it with heat energy instead of time. Those two things are synonymous in the case of heating curves because we're assuming that we are constantly heating over time whatever substance it is we're graphing. So if we read this phase change diagram from left to right, we are heating or adding energy to the system in order to go from a solid to a liquid and a liquid to a gas. Notice we've added the more technical terms for the phase change. When we warm the solid up in order to get it to go into its liquid phase, that's called melting during the phase change. And when we warm up the liquid to get it to turn into a gas, that's called the boiling phase change. Or you may also seen it labeled as vaporization, same as the delta H VAP from previous lessons. And if we go from right to left across this phase change diagram, we have cooling 
In other words, to get from a gas to a liquid to go backwards, our phase change is going to be condensation or condensing. And to go from a liquid to a solid to cool it down, we're going to freeze it. You may also remember this referred to as delta H of fusion from previous lessons. But what if we go directly from a solid to a gas and skip the whole liquid phase in between? If you recall from the triple point lab linked in the description below, that's like what dry ice does. And going from a solid to a gas is referred to as sublimation. Since it's going from left to right across this table, we can also assume that sublimation is a process that requires heat to occur. But what if we go from a gas to a solid instead and skip the liquid in between? That word is a little less known. It's called deposition. That's like what happens to water vapor outside when it directly hits your windshield during the winter and turns to ice immediately. Since this is going from right to left across this phase change diagram, we know that this is a process that would be cooling or giving off heat. So flashback to chemical versus physical change then. Is phase change physical or chemical? Recall that chemical changes are things that actually change the chemicals and the atoms order themselves. For example, if you are going to let a green apple rot, that rotten part of the apple can never be undone. The chemicals over on this side of the apple are now different than the chemicals on the brown side of the apple. That's also why they taste different. That's a chemical change. A physical change, however, is something that can be undone. So when we boil water, it it doesn't change the water itself. The process of boiling merely takes the same water molecule, two H's connected to one O, and turns it into something that has high energy so that it can be a gas and float around the room. So then a phase change would have to be a physical change. So then wait a second, we can say that phase changes also have tie-ins to thermochemistry? Yes, of course, because we're talking about heat energy when we're talking about heating or cooling. So that means that phase changes can also be classified as exothermic or endothermic. If we were going to look at water changing from a liquid to a gas, does that require or produce energy? Well, going from a liquid to a gas is heating. So we know that that requires energy to occur. Therefore, we can say that the phase change of boiling is actually an endothermic process. Why endothermic? That seems a little contraintuitive, doesn't it? Well, we know that with endothermic reactions, we have to add heat in order for them to occur. Now let's see if you can catch my drift here on where I'm going with this. What about water going from a liquid to a solid then? That's a process of cooling. And in order to cool down, you have to get rid of heat. And to get rid of heat means you are producing heat. Well, then that technically means that the process of freezing is actually exothermic. What? In other words, when you freeze a liquid to a solid like water, it feels hot because exothermic reactions feel hot. Now, when I first learned this concept, it blew my mind. So go ahead and pause the video here and make sure that you can fill in the blanks for exothermic, endothermic, forms, or break spawns, respectively. Ready, go. So hopefully this is the answer you got. Freezing is considered to be exothermic. In other words, it releases heat, it feels hot. Therefore, we can say that freezing forms bonds. Now, let me have some clarification here. When I say it forms bonds, I'm not implying intramolecular bonds, I'm implying intermolecular bonds. So in other words, the O and the H are connected via intramolecular bonds, holding the oxygen and hydrogen together as a water molecule, whereas the bond between the oxygen and hydrogen on two separate water molecules is an intermolecular force or IMF for short. So the bonds I'm talking about here that are forming are not this one, it's this one, the intermolecular forces. In other words, for water to freeze, it has to form even stronger, closer together hydrogen bonds with itself to hold itself together. Whereas if you're going to melt water from a solid to a liquid, that's an endothermic process that requires heat. You have to add heat to the solid ice in order to get it to melt. And when you add the heat, it breaks or disturbs those intermolecular forces between the water molecules. Of course, if you were to continue heating, and go from a liquid to a gas, that's when you fully break apart these intermolecular forces, causing the water to now be able to escape from itself and fly off as a gas. 
Since this is initially a hard topic to wrap your head around, I've created this table just to help you out a little bit. Feel free to copy it down. If you're going to undergo the phase change of fusion or melting, remember that's just like the delta H fuse, going from a solid to a liquid, or going from left to right across that heating curve diagram, that has an enthalpy value of endothermic. It requires heat. And if we're going to vaporize, go from a liquid to a gas, that process is also endothermic. It requires heat. However, if we're going to go from right to left across that heating diagram, we're going to condense gas to a liquid or cooling, and that's an exothermic process that releases heat. Likewise, freezing, going from a liquid to a solid, is also exothermic because it releases heat. This is the reason why in Arizona, it's very common for the orange grove farmers to irrigate and spray down their trees with liquid water before a hard freeze comes. Because they know that as the liquid water freezes, those intramolecular forces between the liquid water becoming a solid are going to release heat. And when that releases heat, it actually heats up all of their orange trees, making it so that their oranges or their produce don't freeze. Farmers applying chemistry, saving their groves. How about sublimation? Going from that solid to a gas, like dry ice. Remember that's endothermic because it's going from the left to the right on your heating phase diagram. And deposition, going directly from gas to solid and skipping the liquid phase, is exothermic because it gives off heat or it's cooling down, therefore giving off heat. So here's a quick flashback then to our pressure and temperature diagrams used in the gas laws unit. We know that those melting and boiling points that are indicative of the phase change on our heating curves are also dependent on this pressure and temperature, just as we learned in the gas laws unit. But why is this the case? We know that when ice or solid water turns into a liquid, the volume will change substantially. And likewise, when water, liquid, forms into a gas, water vapor or steam, that volume also changes substantially. We know that water vapor itself has the largest volume out of any of the phase options for water. The one thing that's important to note though and special and unique about water is that the ice form of water or the solid is actually has a greater volume than its water counterpart, which is unusual because most chemicals have a smaller volume as they freeze, whereas water has a larger volume. Now this is really good for our species and for the planet because otherwise, whenever water would freeze, our entire oceans would freeze, every lake and pond would freeze all the way through. And when that would happen, literally every plant and animal and organism within that body of water would die because it would freeze right on with it. However, when large bodies of water freeze, we know that just the top freezes and underneath stays liquid. This is because solid water, i.e. ice, has a volume that is actually greater than liquid water, therefore making its density less than liquid water. So then the reason that these phase changes are dependent on pressure and temperature, just like the gases, are because of this volume change as you go from a solid to a liquid to a gas. Let's tie in this phase change diagram with our heating curve from before. We know that the melting point for water occurs at zero degrees Celsius, so along this line and at one ATM of pressure. If we were to continue crossing over, notice we end up with a horizontal line going from solid to liquid, just like the horizontal line on our heating curve. And if we were going to find the boiling point for water, we would look at 100 degrees Celsius, also at that one ATM of pressure. And if we were going to go from liquid to gas, we would have to go through a horizontal change. So hopefully you can see why on our heating curve, we end up with something that has horizontals along the way, just like here. Make sure to chickity check yourself before you wreck yourself and see if you can fill in the blanks for these questions. Remember that positive delta H is an endothermic process and negative delta H is an exothermic process. And for the second question, of course you can use phase change more than once. In this video, we went over how to draw a heating curve and the rationale between the diagonal parts on the heating curve and the horizontal parts on the heating curve. Those diagonals are when a chemical is in a certain state, like solid, liquid, 
gas. And the horizontal parts of the line are phase changes. So if we're going to melt or freeze, or if we're going to boil or condense. You would make one of those graphs experimentally for any chemical to determine its temperature of phase changes. We also discussed that reading that heating curve or phase change diagram from left to right is a heating process. Therefore, going from left to right is going to be considered endothermic. It requires energy to happen to heat it up. However, if you are going to read that same diagram from right to left, that's a cooling process or heat is given off. And if heat is given off, it feels warm. Therefore, that's an exothermic process. We also correlated this heating curve to a phase change diagram that we learned in the gas law unit to show how going from solid to liquid would still have that horizontal line to get from one state to another, or going from liquid to gas would also have a horizontal line to get from one state to another, which is synonymous with what you see on a heating curve, if we are assuming the constant pressure, of course. And remember that those melting and boiling points that we have on our heating curves are also dependent on not only the temperature, but also the pressure, which is why we are assuming that the pressure is constant when we try and draw those heating curves. Please give this video a quacks up, and when you're out of luck in chemistry, subscribe to the duck. Keep it quacky. No ducks, no glory.